Now, before I started this book, I had a lot of people being like, I'm really anxious to know how you're going to feel about this character that's introduced in the beginning of it. And I'm like, guys, if you just told me that he punches a shark in the fucking face, I would have told you how I felt already. Hey, what's up, bookworms and bridge burners? Mike, back to talk a little House of Chains. And hey, I didn't call it House of Cards for once. We are going to be talking today about the prologue, book one and book two. This is the prologue through chapter 11 of the fourth book in Malazan, Book of the Fallen. Now, obviously, there are going to be spoilers, hence the name Spoiler Talk. I do have people be like, I didn't know this was spoiler, even though it says Spoiler Talk in the title, so I like to remind people just in case. Uh, well, uh, guys, uh, lots to talk about here. I don't know if it's going to be as much as usual, like Memories of Ice, it was so much more to unpack with than this one, I think. So those videos were a little longer, but uh, how about we just get to it? And I quit, you know, stalling here to try to make the video seem a little longer than it actually is. Uh, I find the best way to do this is break it down by groups. And with this one, let's see here, I got one, two, three, four, five groups. That seems to be about the standard for Ericsson so far. Uh, the groups, I broke them up as uh, uh, Onrak and Troll Singar is your first group, then obviously Karsa Orlong's group. And then we got Tavor and the Malazans. That is the third group. The fourth group is Shaikh and the Rebellion. And then the last one I put with Cotillion because he's kind of pulling the strings of a lot of those other characters that we'll talk about. But let's begin with Onrak and, well, really Troll Singer since the, I guess the prologue starts with him. Hey, guys, I thought there was something wrong with my book when I opened it up and I was reading it on Kindle. And I opened the prologue and I was like, okay, let's get ready for this hour and a half long prologue. And it said like eight minutes in the chapter. And I was like, wow, something must be wrong with my uh, PDF file or something like that. But no, uh, it was just a really short prologue for a change. And I think that's because the prologue actually is part of the regular story in this one, as you do see more of Troll Singar in this. And you do meet uh, Onrak, another Talani Maas, who with me, I, I kind of feel like this is a, a trying to be a Tool replacement. So I'm already kind of standoffish on this because Tool is my guy. But uh, yeah, the prologue is just like with everything else in the series. I'm pretty sure on a reread, this will make more sense. Because right now I'm like, I had people, not as much. Uh, you know, with Memories of Aisha, the people being like, oh, yeah, the prologue is just like one of the best series. This one, they were just like, oh, I can't wait to see your reaction to the prologue. And I'm like, yeah, it's just like the, the reaction to every prologue. Huh? I, I don't know what anything, what any of this stuff is. So I, I'm starting to think maybe people just don't remember what it was like on their first read and they're looking at these things already knowing what they know about the whole series. Maybe that's just it. But uh, yeah, prologue doesn't make a lot of sense. Uh, I, honestly, I don't understand if any of Troll Singar's stuff in this, if it's taking place in the same timeline as the rest of the book, or if this is like years in the past. I haven't figured that out yet. If that's been revealed, uh, I just don't know. Uh, here, here's my thing with, in the last book where you had the uh, the Talani Moss, where you had Ecovian kind of lift their curse or whatever. Uh, I don't know if that people, that, all the Talani Moss like around the globe, if they all have been cured of this, or if it's just the ones that were there. If that's been made clear, I'm a dummy, guys. I might have missed it because with me, that's what me make, make one of the things that make me think this might be more in the past because Onrak is still very much, you know, suffering from the sickness. Uh, the sickness, yes. He's still a big old Skeletor. So uh, I, I don't know. I don't know if that's been made clear. You know, hey, feel free to uh, to school me in the comments. I'll be ready for it. But the the nascent is it nascent nascent i've been saying nascent uh is flooded and i i believe that this is the same one that we saw in dead house gates with uh, with culp and fellison and that group boat and all of them when they were in there so uh okay cool I, I think we did see the same boat with like the headless corpses unless there's just a bunch like that that are rowing these boats down there i i, I don't know but we see troll get chained up and he gets like this brand on his forehead for being a traitor. Uh, again, I don't know very much about what's going on, but uh, sometime later he does meet Onrak. Like I said, I feel like uh, Onrak, the broken, I feel like they're trying to make this like a tool replacement. And like I said, I I'm like standoffish a little bit, but I do like most Talani Moss characters in this story. But um, here's something I don't get. Uh, he frees Troll, he frees, frees Troll, and then they explore like these, these statues of, of these hounds. And he says he thinks that they're more than statues, thinks they're real, so he breaks them and frees the hounds and they attack them. I mean, 
Why, why, why would you do this? You know, that's something that's only kind of even worse with uh, in Carson's chapter where they decide, hey, there's like this demon who's been like uh, imprisoned here. Let's let it out and see what happens. Like, wh why are you guys doing this stuff? Well, I mean, I, I don't even understand what you're thinking. I, I'm the more the type of, hey, I think maybe the gods put that there for a reason. Maybe we shouldn't mess with it. That's just me. That's just me. Uh, I'm not the one to be like, oh, all these things must be free. Oh, hey, they attacked me. It's like that story from Natural Born Killers. Bitch, you knew I was a snake. You know, <laughs> that's kind of how I feel about it. But uh, yeah, a, a lot of this stuff, not really clear to me so far. I, I like both the characters. They seem pretty cool. I, I think that Erickson has definitely got a knack for the duo in this book. Uh, I'm noticing lots of... Most of these groups do have lots of traveling duos. And I don't know if that's just uh, by chance or if that's just something he likes to do. But he is doing it well here. Let's go ahead and move along to Carsa Orlong. Pretty much, I think, the star of the book so far. Um, it wasn't just because of all the hype that I had gotten for this character. And it really wasn't much hype as much as it was just people being like, I'm, I'm curious to see what your reaction is going to be to this character. And I was like, okay, well, look. He finally stuck with one POV character. If you watched any of my Memories of Ice stuff, you know I had a problem with it. It's like, Erickson, can we please stick with one group for five minutes here? Too many POV changes, I think, in Memories of Ice. With this one, yeah, he sticks with one character for 250 pages. And you know what? I think it might be my favorite part of any Malazan book yet. It was, It felt like a regular story, you know? <laughs> I felt like I was getting growth from my character. I was getting character arc. I was, you know, kind of growing with the character. It was great. I loved it. This is probably the least that I have struggled with the beginning of any Malazan book so far. And I loved it. It was fantastic. Um, why would anyone think I wouldn't like this character? This is basically, he's wrote Conan the Sumerian into Malazan. I am all here for a Conan character. Hell yes. Give me more of this. But uh, I think it's because he's not a nice guy, obviously. He rapes, he plunders, he kills children, which I think is a little off-putting at first when you realize is that uh, he's looking at just regular, you know, 30-year-old humans as, like, children kind of thing. I, I kind of looked at it like in, like, a Tolkien novel where elves refer to children as someone who's, like, only 500 years old. You know, it's not actually, like, you know three-year-old human children kind of thing, like it was making it sound. But again, again, uh, I, I can see when I was reading this, I was like, oh boy, uh, I'm going to have some people that are wanting to drop out of this read-along because there is a lot of the R word going on here. But uh, it seems like most people have been okay with it. Uh, I don't want to say they've been okay with it, but they've, they like, they've seemed to have come around on the character. I do think that, you know, from uh, from his first chapter to uh, I think third or fourth chapter, he he seemed like a different character. So he did seem like he was getting some growth here. Uh, I, I think I looked at it. What I said was, uh, okay, I can see what you're doing here. You're making this really detestable character, and you're going to do a, a a character redemption. Which you know you can't predict these things. You don't. No one's predicting anything that Steven Erickson's doing. But uh, that's just kind of what I thought. And I just wouldn't be damned if by like chapter four I was like. <laughs> Well, I'm all in on this character. Hell yeah, I am, am a Carsa fanboy at this point. But I do like the friendship that he has with uh, Bayroth and, and Dellum. Uh, even, despite the, um, him and Bayroth, I think him and Bayroth like, are all about the same woman. And I think Bayroth is actually with said woman. So, uh, hey, despite that, though, they're still going to be friends. You know, bros before hoes in the kingdom of Malazan. So, uh, <laughs> it, it just really went a good way to showing uh, how these guys are, are friends. And it is kind of that thing where it's like, okay, well, Carsa, you're doing some dumb stuff here. But, you know, when you're friends, you think in real life, don't you, didn't you do some stupid stuff when you were younger with some of your friends just because they were doing it and you wanted to be there for them? You know, you wanted to have their back. You wanted to do that. So, uh, yeah, it was it was good. I, I hated seeing the, you know, those two not make it. But uh, like I've said recently, uh, in a Malazan book, though, you'll probably see him again. Hell, I wouldn't be surprised if you see him again. Uh, wait, you do. Uh, <laughs> uh, but when we go on past that point where he befriends uh, Torvald. Torvald is a really fun character. I, I liked him a lot. It really just really made me think of... I can't think of a character's name in the movie Gladiator where Maximus befriends the, the other slave. That's kind of what it felt like, almost kind of like a, a Gladiator kind of style uh, of storytelling here, and uh, I, I did notice the name Torvald Nam, so I, I guess he is related to Ralik Nam. I want to say his cousins. I think that kind of comes out. Uh, I, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know how close they are, how how tight second cousins, third cousins, things like that are. But uh, still, cool to see the name. I, I'd like to see Ralik Nam come back in the series, though. That'd be really really cool. But Silgar, man, Silgar is a real 
real piece of work, isn't he? Uh, you know what? I think he gave you someone to really root against. And with Carsa, you knew that the guy was going to end up getting his eventually. And yeah, he gets it bad. You know, he is, he is, he is, uh, <laughs> he's half the man he used to be, quite literally. But um, I started thinking around this point that if he's spending this much time on Carsa, I feel like this is a character that we knew already. Uh, it was a character I felt like it was someone we had seen in this series before and maybe under a different name or something like that. So I started thinking back to the last time we were in Seven Cities because that's where they're going now. And I started thinking, okay, well, who have we seen that could... I, oh, my God, this is Corbolo Dom. I thought for sure, is, is this him? The guy, he kills children in that book, you know? He's a, just a completely ruthless... Of, they said he used to... I think believe that Corbolo Dom used to... Or Corbolo Dom used to work actually for uh, for, for the Malazan Empire. But I was like, nah, let's kind of explain that away. Well, obviously, I was wrong. It is not him. It was revealed actually to be Toblakai. But hey, I thought it was a pretty good guess. So I was on the right path, but I had the wrong character. But uh, that was kind of the parallel that I was drawing there. But yeah, guys, kind of what I joked about in the beginning. Uh, the part where he actually just will fight a shark. You know, I forget the character's name he's carrying, and he's already died. And the shark tries to take him off his back, and he turns around. He f actually physically fights a shark. And like, why would you do that for a dead guy? I said, because he was my responsibility. You know what? And I, right there, I was like, ton of respect. Ton of respect for this character to do that. You know, felt like he, he you know, hey, the guy died, but you know what? I'm not going to just like let his body be ripped to shreds on top of that. So, hey, good for him. Um, yeah, anytime you're punching a shark in the face, uh, it's a character I'm going to like. But uh, the statue god stuff, that's kind of a head scratcher. I can't say I understand very much that stuff's going on, but I rarely ever understand any of the God stuff in this. But I, I do like part where he kind of stands up to his gods, basically, and says he's going to handle shit his way. So, yeah, uh, Karsa is a character I feel like even people who aren't in the read-along that aren't really enjoying this book, they really like Karsa. So uh, I, I hope he is a character that's here to stay. He isn't going to be a one-and-done, like a Ekovian or something like that. I hope he's going to be here for a while. I'd actually like to see him uh, cross paths with uh, Mapo Nicarium because I think that those will be some fun conversations. Let's get into Tavor and the Malazans here. This was the toughest stretch of the book for me, guys. Uh, lots of exposition about events that happened pre-Gardens of the Moon. Kind of tough to really wrap my head around some of the stuff and understand who is who. As always, in Erickson, because basically, when you get book one in this, uh, the, the faces in the... What was it called? Faces in the Rock, I think the first book was called. Which was just all about a new character. Uh, where this is basically like your book one and the other Malazan book. Where we're, okay, here's all the players. We're going to get them all in place, stuff like that. And we're going to throw a bunch of new names at you. And then we're going to do lots of exposition about some previous history. And it started becoming just soup trying to you know weave through this and, and understand everything that was going on so uh, i had to do uh what i said i was going to do and just roll with it and if it'll make if it's important it'll make sense later because right now it's like it's just it's just too much going on uh even fiddler really couldn't help this section for me uh and, and erickson what's the deal man why why you got enough characters stop giving them second names now he's going by strings and i think crocus is going by cutter and it's just like it's, it's, stop Stop. Can we just have our characters have one name, please? There's too many characters as it is. But uh, this chapter is all really about uh, bad omens and stuff like that. Uh, bad omen. I guess the, the 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 child that stands where fellow not fellas and Tavor was, and they basically is this is this omen of a child is going to lead them to their death and all this stuff. I mean. Anytime you get into stuff like this, I'm starting to be like, all right, well, I'm, I'm personally, I'm not really superstitious on these types of things. I have, I've been a sports fan for years, and I realize that superstition is just, you know, a thing you do to, like, grow a beard or not change your socks or stuff like that. Uh, with stuff like this, I, I, I don't know. The only stuff I really liked about this section is where she's still anxious to find her sister, and she finds out, you know, about how events went down during the calling and stuff like that. And she's still very anxious to find her sister. And, oh, my God, is she in for a surprise eventually? And I can't wait for that moment. Uh, I know I've said that uh, Lestara and Pearl are probably the least entertaining characters in this whole story for me. Try is giving Lestara a bit of a backstory here. And it's quite interesting. I, I believe... You find out that Quickbin is the one who actually rescued her uh, before she went to the Red Blade. So that's 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 an interesting little thing. I might have actually got that wrong. I might just I, I think if the name was 
I can't even remember the name, guys. Sorry, it's just too much. But uh, yeah, yeah, I, I'm still really lukewarm, Listora, but I'm going from like, don't give a fuck to lukewarm. So I feel like that's an improvement right there. Pearl can, I, I'm still waiting for Kalam to stab him. Okay, so I'll, I'll wait patiently for that. Let's move ahead to Shaikh and the Rebellion, that side of this battle. Ah, uh, this one's just a hair better, I think, than Tavor's section. Uh, this is, guys, this is my struggle with military fantasy. If this is, I understand it's realistic, and this is what it's like. What I'm saying is I don't like reading about sitting around and waiting and getting your troops in order and waiting and sitting around a campfire and waiting and waiting and waiting. That's not anything I like to read. Yes, I get that. That's, every time I say this, we're like, well, that's what it's really like. I get that. Doesn't mean I want to read it. So that's a me thing, guys. I'm just, I'm not wild about it. And that's why I think I'm really never going to click on military fantasy. Thankfully, this series has enough other stuff that I like that I can overlook that. But that's why sections like this really, really are a struggle for me. It's just all of the waiting. Can we just get on with it? But I like the stuff with Aboric. Uh, I like this stuff with him wanting to protect uh, Felis and the Younger from the would-be rapist, uh, is it Bitathol? Bitathol? Yeah, that guy That guy needs to, uh, Carson needs to pay him a visit in his sleep. Please, can we have that happen? Uh, I do like the stuff with the mages. I like the stuff with, uh, is it Lorik, how he understands the whole Jade statue thing uh, and tries telling Aboric about it. I, the way I believe it was kind of made up is where that uh, Borat gets told this stuff and it like blows his mind. But as the reader, we don't really know exactly what was revealed. But again, I might have just missed it. So much going on in these chapters that I might have just kind of not, not totally grasped, grasped what was going on with the Jade statue stuff from a... Uh, from Deadhouse Gates, but uh, again, Haboric's a, a character I really like, and I, I'm worried for Haboric. I really, really am, because I think back to Deadhouse Gates, and uh, if I recall correctly, Toblikai, before we knew he was Karsa, uh, was always trying to, to kill Haboric, and we didn't really understand why. And now that I know what Karsa's like, I'm afraid he might actually kill Haboric. So <laughs> I am worried for my ghost hands here, so uh, Fenir, protect him, please. But. Uh, Felicent is relieved to find out that her brother is still alive. So it's interesting when you got the three uh, Peron uh, siblings here and seeing that they all kind of care about each other in different ways. Uh, Tavor uh, obviously doesn't know what has happened with Felicent and she still cares for her sister, wants to find out about her, whereas Felicent uh, cares about Ganos and wants to protect her. And, and Ganos is just like, yeah, whatever. Uh, I hope you guys are all right. But whereas uh, Felicen's like, yeah, Tabor must die, you know? So uh, interesting family dynamic there. But it is interesting to see that they all still are very aware of each other and still are very interested in finding one another one way or the other. Let's move on to the last section here, guys. This is Cotillion. Is he, he's the rope, right? I think they call him the rope. Uh, sorry, you got so many names. I mean, hey, I, this guy's Dancer. This guy's Cotillion. This guy's the rope. It's just like... A, just give me one name, please. Let's let's stick to that. But uh, he does ask Kalam to inspect things and find out who could be making a play for the House Shadow. Um, Kalam, apparently him and Manala are married now. So uh, they're kind of training all those children that Shadow Throne revived for him. And they're like training him to be like uh, his new army. And he's actually kind of uh, shook about how good they are, about, uh, you know, how... How easily trained they are into being like assassins, basically, and uh, so he's kind of looking to get away. I don't think that uh, you know being domesticated is quite working for him. And I mean, did anybody not see that coming? So when Cotillion asks him if he'll go check some stuff out, he's like, "Yeah, please, let's go, let's go." But um, I, I maybe I didn't understand this because of this. There's there's so many objects and relics and stuff in this series that it's just like I try to understand the power levels in this series sometimes and I just can't do it. Apparently he has these jewels, these diamonds that are basically like nuclear bombs and can fucking summon demons and shit. And he decides he's going to trade them for a couple of knives. So, yeah, uh, Kalam loves his knives, don't he? So, <laughs> uh, what about Crocus? Like I said, he's going by the name Cutter now because he's been uh, doing some bandit work. But uh, I think Homeboy is just confused it's that kind of thing where you see these guys who will move across the country 
for a girl and they get there and realize they didn't know anything about this girl at all but they're too far in to go back now he's thinking that Absalar might actually be ascending and he's like well I guess I'll do that too you know <laughs> he, he doesn't really know uh, what he's doing uh, like I said I, I feel like that is uh, Erickson writing every teenage boy into a story uh, who sees a pretty girl and chases him and doesn't know what's going on has no clue about anything and by the way with Absalar is it really weird that her dad just dies off the page Really odd choice after doing all that point to establish that reveal in Deadhouse Gate. So uh, interesting there, and I I believe Hood visited him. I don't even said it might be Hood. I, yeah, I did that a lot in this section, guys, a lot. But uh, Cotillion visits Crocus and offers to bless his blades, and I believe Crocus says something like, "Not if it's done by magic." I I, I don't know. I don't understand what was going on with this section really at all, except for the fact that Crocus says, "Hey." I like that little hellhound you got there, Blind. Uh, well, next time I'm in a bind, I want to be able to summon Blind. That'll be like my payment for working for you. And he says, yeah, sure, sure. So uh, Cotillion has just got everybody doing all kinds of stuff for him behind the scenes. And I, I guess it's kind of interesting because I feel like we've gotten so much with uh, what is Shadow Throne up to? What is Shadow Throne doing? Now we're going to see Cotillion is playing the game as well. And it remains to be seen uh, uh, if it's just for... Uh, his own self-benefit or for the realm. We'll see. Uh, but he does tell Crocus that they've got to visit some unnamed island. And Absalom is like, oh yeah, of course we do. Uh, okay. But they go there. They shipwreck. They're separated. Uh, um, Darius, was that his name? This Tist Andy saves Crocus and tells him that, yeah, Absalom probably drowned. Well, guys, you don't see a body. Yeah, yeah, she'll be fine. Uh, but then this island is under attack by something, and Crocus decides, hey, I'm smart. I'm going to deduce that this means that the Tist Eater are the ones coming to take over the throne of Shadow. And I'm like, I don't know how he came to that, to that conclusion, but it was probably actually really clear, and I just missed it because, guys, book one is probably one of my favorite stretches in this whole run with Malazan so far, and book two might be one of my least favorite stretches in any part of any Malazan book up to this point. So it really is a tale of two halves here because book one, amazing. Book two, I cannot stay awake. So um, I, I don't want to say I expected that, but look, I'm looking back at my previous videos and the first half has never been as good as the second half. His books have seemed to be really backloaded for me. So when you kind of have this new section for book one, which where book one is usually all your setup and all your new characters, this one has one new character, and then book two is basically that traditional setup for everything. So I like to believe all the board pieces are set now, and now we're going to do like usual. Now, look, every single time I read a new Malazan book in the first half, I'm like, oh, God, what have I gotten myself into? Oh, this is just a struggle in some places. And then the second half always pops off. I expect this one to do exactly the same. There are things that I like better. I do like that the prologue is actually has a character that is in the full book this time. Isn't just something that's just going to have maybe make sense at the end, maybe, maybe not. Maybe it's going to make sense on a reread only, that kind of stuff. Stuff. So I, I do like that. But uh, like I said, the second halves have been routinely better. So I do expect that to happen. But yeah, uh, the very, very positive on Car side. I think that's a really cool character. And I'm hoping to see a lot, lot more. Uh, seems like he is just on his way to doing this kind of journey of finding himself. And that's the kind of character I feel like has been missing from this story up to this point. Like I said, man, big Robert E. Howard, big Conan fan. So uh, if that is the influence, I mean, that's awesome. I, that would be shocking to me. Uh, I don't know if that's just me wanting that. I don't know. We'll see. But uh, everybody was most interested in how I was going to feel about that character. Uh, very, very positive. I'm very, very excited to see where he goes next. And I'm interested to know a little more about Onrak because, like I said, I do love my Talani Moss and I want to have that kind of fun character. <laughs> they just have this weird wit, you know, just a dry humor that I think the series really, really does need. So, guys, that was the first half. Um, I'll be doing the second half on vacation, so I'll be reading this really, really dark, horrible, cruel stuff in paradise on a nice beach with blue crystal water. It's going to be great. So, guys, what did you think of the first half of House of Change? Drop in the comments and let me know. And when I get back, I will read them and talk to you about them there. Have a great week.